and stories. Um, and this has to do with cannibalism, which you probably weren't expecting. <laughs> um, so the biggest adventure story in Anna Windy Poplars is that some of the Pringle men engaged in cannibalism when they were shipwrecked. Um, and this story is not most, it's, it's most relevant not in its own right, but because of how it inadvertently helps Anne succeed in Summerside. So um, if this were a different kind of book, you can imagine the cannibalism scenario taking up a whole adventure story, a whole adventure novel. Um, not just the few lines that we get in Anna Windy Poplars. So this all comes about when one of Anne's friends is writing a local history, the history of Prince County, and asks Anne to kind of scout around for material. So Anne comes across a ship log which contains details of the cannibalism. Um, so the description is we nearly starved. In the end, they et up Jonas Selkirk, who had shot himself. Myron told me this himself, seemed to think it a good joke. Um, of course, this is not a joke, especially to Christian women whose pride resides in their male relatives' success on the high seas. The Pringles are forever Anne's friends after this, however, in an effort to make sure she never reveals their deepest, darkest secret, and they can maintain their status in Summerside and on the island. So the men's adventure story must remain untold, making room for Anne's narration of her successful everyday life. So I'll um, conclude with three points, um, and then we'll wrap up. So um, first of all, Mon for Montgomery, um, PEI towns are most important for providing opportunities and possibilities for the island's youth. In terms of economics, health, and well-being, towns need the rural and the natural, including the sea. So towns can't forget that they're PEI towns, that they're towns on a rural island. I also think, um, and this is something that really interests me, that Montgomery kind of gives us some lessons for living ecologically which I think is particularly interesting as we grapple with climate change and most Canadians now live in cities. So um, I think in Montgomery's work, it seems that it's not just places of spectacular beauty that deserve protecting, but everyday lived in spaces too, the places where we actually live, so increasingly in towns and suburbs. Um, and she highlights for us the importance of that contact with nature in our everyday lives and reminds us of the beauty of that humble throwaway nature, like even the dandelion in the sidewalk. Um, and she reminds us too that those, that kind of nature is important for our everyday uh, well-being. And in a car culture, with our sedentary lifestyles, when we're told that sitting is the new smoking, Anne's model of regular walks um, points to the necessity of walkable cities for stress relief and physical health. And walking is also important for community building. You get out and you actually meet that sailor with the gold rings in his ears and potentially hear his story. Um, Montgomery, too, ideally sees us shaping our living areas in ways that are connected to the natural world. So we remember that we're connected to the natural world. And maybe we don't want the winds howling through our houses like Anne seems to enjoy, but we can um, make sure that gardens and walks and sunsets are parts of our everyday lives, and which of course makes us healthier and makes life more beautiful and enjoyable. Thank you. myself, one of the, I guess one of the tropes of modern urban versus rural yeah. geography is the characteristics of the people contrasted urbanites versus ruralites. So right. the, simplistically, urbanites are viewed as being sort of, they, they can be anonymous in the big yeah. city, uh, but there, there's, there's certain sort of almost shared characteristics of an urbanite, uh, sometimes good and sometimes bad, whereas a rural person has it, their own set of, of human characteristics. Um, but I didn't sort of see that in some of the, what you presented. Was there anything in Anne's books that talked about the, the characteristics of the people, their idiosyncrasies or the personal characteristics that might contrast between a rural person versus an urban person? And maybe, a, maybe I'll give you what might be a partial answer, and that is that Charlottetown at the time that they were writing 
is not the kind of city we think of as an urban city today, even a Charlottetown of today. And maybe there wasn't that much of a contrast in terms of the behaviors and characteristics of, of urban Charlottetown and Somerset people then versus the rural PEI. I think, um, I, well, certainly I think in, in Anna Green Gables, I mean, there's only a few chapters set in Charlottetown, but except for Josephine Berry, we don't really, and you know, she's kind of fits into that, the, you know, an elite version of what we might imagine a city person to be. Um, but a lot of the time Montgomery just writes out the town people that the focus is so much on the Avonlea. So it kind of, if nature's kind of taking over the city, so are the Avonlea people or the people from rural PEI. Um, but of course then, like in, in Summerside, and again, you know, even, you know, not what we think of as the city, even more so than Charlottetown. Um, and that the Pringles, though, maybe aren't so much urban people as, um, The governing family, kind of in a big, in a big village, um, and then in I kind of skipped over the Toronto bit by accident. But in Jane of Lantern Hill, there's quite a, a chunk of um, a set in the city. Um, but again, you know, Jane, and then she makes friends with the, little, the girl next door. They're kind of all in the rural Montgomery mode. So she's she doesn't pose that on the city. Um, but then Jane has these kind of nouveau riche, well, nouveau riche uncle who's building a, or getting a house in the, the new suburbs, which you know Jane doesn't approve of because it's not like real nature, like in PEI, but kind of this manufactured nature. Um, so I guess in that way you have kind of two different ways of looking at the world: one coming from an urban to suburban, and then Jane who comes more the urban rural. Her PEI. Um, way of thinking influences the kind of suburban home she wants, which is a more natural one. Um, but I think that it's all, for Montgomery, it's usually just about, um, the focus is often so much, I think, on the on the, the rural perspective and not so much maybe on the urban versus rural. Mm -hmm. um, but that's important, yeah, important things to think mm -hmm. through. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Barbara. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have a question. You alluded to the actual author's own personal um, educational piece, and I guess her own commentary on having the same rights. So do you think that that's also possible? This need to be in nature always was her personal source of inspiration and sort of spiritual connection. And you know, there was the way you kept saying that she brings you know, the focus to the, the rural to the urban with the trees, and you know, and I can't think. I think about my own self when I'm walking, how I feel. I'm always in nature, even though I'm in downtown mm -hmm. Charlottetown or somewhere else. So I'm just curious, do you think that happened? Or is yeah, that? it was definitely, a, the nature was a source of inspiration and comfort, a solace, a, imagination of all kinds of things from Montgomery, which you really see influencing her writing. Um, so yes, yeah, absolutely. And I know that, you know, she really, she. She struggled a bit, you know, living in, say, Halifax, um, and the, the, she talked a lot about the dirt and the grime, so she didn't like those things that kind of got in her way of enjoying nature, but she spent a lot of time in Point Pleasant Park, so she really sought out the nature where she could. So. Right, and I know I lived in Halifax for six summers, and I was in the park every chance I got mm -hmm. for the same reason, so it's interesting. You kind of just showed me something that I hadn't thought about. Her, her, it was like this other lens, I guess, and a much more mature voice coming to this, these other books other than the romanticized Anne Shirley of mm -hmm. the play or the story. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. and they can read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, yeah, that's, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, yeah, how that kind of love of nature is adapted to an older Anne, right? That yeah. it becomes a way of her dealing with more adult stresses yeah. as, you know, Montgomery. Questions? Uh, I am uh, uh, a native of Summerside okay. myself, uh, and I hadn't, uh, I read only out of Green Gables, so it's interesting to see the, that uh, Montgomery used Summerside and other mm -hmm. island settings, which I wasn't aware of. Uh, one interesting point is that, in, in historical terms, is that 
I think Summerside has the only school building dating from the 19th century okay. still in active use, okay. although it's been somewhat transformed. That is the now the summer is it called the Summerside Elementary Parkside. School? Parkside. Parkside School. Mm -hmm. I went to it uh, uh, in the past, and it, it uh, uh, is uh, still uh, functioning, which is quite rare in Prince Edward Island for school buildings to survive that. That long, and I expect that Summerside people aren't aware of the connection with Ellen Montgomery. Fictional connection is that right. she never herself really went to the. Just very briefly was in Summerside. But she, uh, she, she did she spend time in Summerside, Ellen Montgomery? Just very briefly. Yeah. yeah. But not as a uh, teacher, no. No. <coughs> uh, well, that, that's that's one point. Uh, the other historical point is. Um, uh, you mentioned the, the, the I think Anne of Green Gables was sat vaguely in her youthful period, isn't it, in the 1880s, probably. Yeah, um, I know that there's all kinds of ways. People have tried to sort out the timelines and there yeah. are inconsistencies, but... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I realize yeah. that. The, the, um, and there, there is, is there a train in Anne of Green Gables? Yes, there yes, would be. Yeah, I guess there would be. Yeah. But the, the connection, the, the only, there was no uh, train ferry uh, in her day, even in Ellen Montgomery's time. The train ferry only began in 1917. So the, the connection with the, the, um, uh, the boat would have been through Charlottetown, as you, as you said, which uh, wouldn't have been a, a ferry by its definition of a uh, you know, train uh, ferry. Um, the, those are just comments, and I, think, I don't know if you want to say anything about them. Otherwise, I'll go on to uh, another point. Mm -hmm. um, well, the school is interesting. I just I, there's potential for a Montgomery tour or something in the summer. So well, right yes, now, there is. Yeah. 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 The other uh, uh, general comment is I happen to see, uh, which is uh, rare. I saw the um, the new. Uh, Anne of Green Gables film on Netflix in, in the UK. Uh, by, uh, uh, I made a point of watching it when I, I had Netflix. And I was very uh, disappointed. Not if, Forget the storyline as such, which was greatly altered, but in the setting of, the, um, of Avonlea as such, was not Avonlea as I think Montgomery would have conceived. And I don't know how many people have seen this. Uh, yeah. It was more uh, Avonlea, uh, which we assume was Cavendish, was really, as most rural communities are today, just uh, a, a community without much more than a corner uh, store and a blacksmith shop and such. Uh, whereas they had portrayed it as a sort of small town with a bank and uh, right. other uh, things. So that was rather um, mm -hmm. uh, not. The I wouldn't say disappointing, but uh, I corrected, you know, saying, "Oh, this is this is wrong," and I think this often happens with uh, when when F. Montgomery, F. when Green Gables and uh, other novels are put into a modern setting, they're they're enlarged or uh, made greater than um, than the actual setting of the period when she was writing. And I guess too, where the bank ends up playing such an important role in the story, um, that just having it right there. I guess maybe, I don't know, but it, maybe it's, you know, playing to the tourism industry too, where people have this idea of Avonlea Village and yeah. expectations of more of the town. Yeah, even the Avonlea Village on Prince Edward Island is a total misrepresentation of what uh, her world setting would have been. Mm -hmm. um, they have a nucleated little village mm -hmm. uh, up in Cavendish, but uh, I, I think it's more for, for tourists than um, purists. Other <laughs> 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 comments? Yeah, Robert. Yeah, I guess I, I would, I'm interested in this uh, relationship between uh, the technology and the urbanization. So, I mean, obviously, your research these days is very uh, poised at the, the forefront of technology. Mm -hmm. And 
so now you're in Charlottetown, you're not in Halifax, you're not yeah. in Toronto. But I would presume you have access to the technology, but you might not um, be discussing it with as many people as you would be if you were in a more urban setting. And, and I guess I'm just curious, uh, what I've heard from you and from Betsy Arpoli is that um, the land was very technologically savvy, or right. at least receptive. And so did she look to Charlottetown or to Halifax for access to the technology, or did she already have it and she was really uh, satisfied that she could use it to appreciate her rural environment and maybe even communicate um, you know, the, uh, uh, the characteristics of her urban mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. through telescopes or binoculars or typewriters or whatever it was that she had at her disposal. Yeah. That's a really interesting question because you think that, yeah, sometimes to, you know, to be on the cutting edge, you have to be really plugged into the urban world. But you know, she was, she had her camera, which would have been quite unusual, right? And, yeah. you know, Cavendish of the turn of the 20th century. And, but she was really interested in taking pictures of, um, you know, the landscapes that she grew up with, the beach and the, um, mm -hmm. the McNeil home where she grew up. So yeah, she very much was using it to, as another way on top of her writing to capture that rural environment. Mm -hmm. um, and then the night sky too, with her interest in astronomy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, but that would be something to find out more about like how, how she actually got a hold of this technology. Um, yeah, and whether, I mean, she would have been ex working in a newspaper office, she would have been in Halifax, she would have expo been exposed to certain kinds of technology. Yeah. Um, also, I would imagine that in a, in a rural environment, if she was an advocate of, of you know, what was then state of the art technology, that would have separated her from a number of her yeah. uh, uh, neighbors. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. she was used to that, right? She yeah. was an outlier for all the reading she did, and then, the, then of course, the writing. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to be talking to the Shad Valley students about Montgomery and technology at the end of July, so I'll report back. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. No, that's a part of you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yes? Yes. One thing I know is that there's not so much a judgmental value of comparison between urban and rural environments as there is a change in the personal lives of Anne and Margaret, and Margaret Gumwee. Because you see, in the situation, both Anne and Mar came from a, from a rural, yeoman farmer community, agrarian community, in which women's roles were rather prescribed and limited, and social mobility was in general limited. And Anne went on by moving to, to, to Charlottetown and Summerside to become a, a, a school principal and a doctor's wife who marked the change in both freedom, individual freedom and a, and a social class and probably a persona. And Mark, by moving, uh, moving around, became a, a, a member of the arts community and the, and the wife of a minister, and also underwent a transition in, in social class and freedom as a woman. And maybe she tended to see the transition between community as part of, of her own opening up and her own opportunities rather than a, a general comparison between the virtues of rural and urban life. Certainly, as um, especially in the Ontario period of her life, when she so um, she her um, her husband was a Presbyterian minister in Norval and Leesdale, just north of Toronto. So she was really engaged with the literary world in Toronto, and then eventually retires there. Um, so there would have been yeah more of an understanding of of, her, of urban life, and she was integrated into the literary world there. Although that wasn't always such a positive relationship, because there were a lot of new made to cut her out of the literary world. Um, but, yeah, um, yeah, I think certainly, you know, Montgomery's own life and her different, um, her different interactions with the urban um, world are influencing her representation.
representation, um, her representation of Anne. And I think that, you know, part of what I'm saying is that I think for Montgomery, there's, there's no kind of clear cut um, distinction between the urban and the rural. For her, they're, they're, they're more integrated. Because it's not so much transition between an urban and a rural community, it's a transition between two communities. I mean, if Lucy Mart or Anne had a, had a booth in one community where they who a farmer's child and expect to become a farmer's wife and become a teacher or something, or a minister's wife in another rural community, it might have been the same thing. But you know, it's like sociologists point out, when you change the social role and you change yeah. your persona, it's often helpful to move to a new community where you're not known as you really Yeah, I guess I was thinking about all of that in terms of kind of how town helps change those social roles, right? Because without there being PwC, PwC or Queens that, and especially for Anne, without there being Queens and, um, well, they, yeah, the education helps change those roles. But then I guess at the end of the day, the roles are really changed through marriage through these women, which allow them to have a different role, maybe no matter what. status there than she did as Anne the orphan. Um, but yeah, so that's, 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 yeah, that's an interesting way of looking about it, about thinking about um, the social, the social roles in terms of place. I'm just thinking of Jane of Lantern Hill where she's a little girl in urban Toronto and then in suburban Toronto. So maybe that's a good comparison of how, you know, being in the same social role, how it relates differently to two different and how in that one Montgomery is really interested in the um, transformation of urban space from the movement from moving downtown to the suburbs. Thank, thank you. Barb, did you have another comment? No, I'm going to stop. Okay. okay. <laughs> I just have one quick, and I yeah. am so appreciative of you taking a look at the island context. And so just before um, we began, you mentioned about islands, the metaphorical islands. Right. Have you come across any? Uh, it's in, in um, so, the, well, there's been a, um, yeah, there's been a lot of work done, well, like Elizabeth Waterston's uh, Magic Islands, thinking about islands, both metaphorical and real, so kind of Montgomery's interior life is an island, for example. Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, that's, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a metaphor that, you know, even in this context of thinking about individuals and communities and the imagined life versus the life that you have in a community, that um, it's a rich metaphor. Islands within islands. Yes, you know, yeah. Communities that are islanded. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. This is just <laughs> Thursday, um, the 24th at the Carriage House, and then June 24th in Summerside. But this coming Thursday, she's going to she's mounting a little production down at Veterans Affairs in the atrium, and there will be readings um, by Barbara Rodenizer as well as Hank Stinson, and I get to be the narrator, so I have a new hat, wow. an old hat, and a cool dress, and um, the regiment band and the um, Canada Remembers Choir. So it'll be a really lovely evening, 7 o'clock. It tells the whole story through Georgina Pope's um, uh, journal entries and read by the, the actors. So I hope you can join us for any and all of these events and I'm um, looking forward to hearing your ideas. If anybody has any about lecture series for next year, always happy 
to uh, <laughs> mythical islands. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again for coming. It's really great.